The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Step outside of your comfort zone. See the world with a whole new perspective. Join us and experience the unexplained on the Paranormal View. And welcome everybody right here to Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. I want to thank everyone for being with us tonight. Those here in the chat room and those listening from around the world. Sorry we had a little bit of problems again getting connected, but that happens from time to time. But we're on tonight, and I want to thank everybody for taking the time to be with us. Got a great show lined up tonight, and we have with us Barbara Duncan. Hello, everyone. And we have uh, Jeffrey Gould. Hello, hello. We have Tabby Cat Gash. Hey, everybody. And the sound's even working now. (laughs) So Yeah. (laughs) All right. With that, uh, Jeff, why don't you uh, quickly introduce our guest? All right. Well, tonight our guest is James Keenan. He's a Los Angeles native, where I'm living now. Uh, he's high schooled in El Paso, Battle Hands of Fate territory. And James got his bachelor from the University of California, Santa Barbara, near Bar Barbara. Uh, the former law enforcement and private investigator, James has been writing for several years and has authored seven books on cryptids, UFOs, and aliens. He's been on paranormal podcasts, radio shows, television series, and presented lectures to the paranormal and UFO community. And in addition to writing, he devotes a good portion of the year to researching and locating strange historic anomalies throughout the world. Currently, James is researching and investigating locations in Mexico, Scotland, Armenia, and northeast Utah. So welcome, welcome, James Keenan. Hi, hi everybody. Thanks for having me on. All right, it's working now, so we're good. <laughs> uh, from time to time, we have those kind of difficulties, but uh, normally it works real good every time. But last week, it was I got locked out and couldn't even get back into Centova, so I couldn't even do the show. <laughs> and we have occasional EVPs, uh, James, so uh, you know you might hear something coming through. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's all right. I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we was we was doing the show one night, and all of a sudden, I'm hearing this foghorn, ship's foghorn. And Barbara lives in San Francisco, so figured, well, it's got to be coming from the bay. And I asked her, she says, no, nothing's been blowing here. <laughs> yeah, I don't hear foghorns this far in. So. I was I was once house sitting uh, for some friends while I was doing the show, and. Uh, some weird typing started happening from a manual typewriter, and none of us have a manual typewriter. And then when my friends got back, then then they told me the place was haunted. I'm like, you wait till you get back to tell me the place is haunted? I'd have been investigating all weekend. <laughs> so, Skinwalker Ranch, um, you're on the, the show there. What What is it that you actually do? Sure. So uh, no matter where I'm at, what I do is I take in a lot of technology. Uh, I've always felt that if you're investigating, uh, you know, something that deals with ufology or the unexplainable, the high strangeness, there's a group of people that are into that and uh, they, they understand the phenomena. And then there's those science guys that all they require are the data points. So I do both. And when I'm at uh, Skinwalker Ranch, you know, I'll take several different types of uh, magnetometers or gradiometers for 3D ground imaging. I have a ground penetrating radar, um, very high end spectrum analyzers, gamma radiation detection units. And I will, uh, it's almost like uh, a paranormal investigation on steroids, I guess you could say, because I, I'm not just looking at what people can physically see. I'm looking through the walls, through the ground, through rock, through the water, <laughs> wherever I can think. Now, this is a sort of investigation of the type of tools that one would also take to, if they're studying crop circles, for example, right? 
Yeah, yeah, would. Uh, so remember that um, even though I, I was in uh, law enforcement and private investigations, uh, I, I was schooled in archaeology and anthropology. So okay. uh, I'm I'm originally was looking for, you know, an ancient, ancient anomalies that were pointing uh, towards like past worldwide catastrophic events that mm-hmm. caused us to lose historical data on cultures and civilizations. And the only way to do that is to be able to look into the ground. And a lot of times in these places like Mexico, you're not allowed to touch the ground because the government owns it. You know, even if it's under somebody's home, they own what's in the ground. So you have to cheat in a way and use three ground imaging or ground penetrating radar, things of that nature. So by that, you mean you're looking at possible floods or mudslides, which would wipe out villages, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, like in uh, Shiwakan, which is in the west coast of Mexico. Uh, it's a huge site that very few people know about, and it was hit with a massive tsunami hundreds of years ago that pretty much buried eight kilometers, uh, well, eight square kilometers of the city under sand. Wow. And uh, only 2% or less has actually been excavated. So, yeah, you're completely right. It's, it's you know, trying to find a needle in a haystack. It's better when you have the right equipment. Well, you say that you can't excavate because the state itself uh, doesn't really want you to. Now, do you have to get special permits or do you just, you know, are they just going to say, no, you're not going to do it? Well, it, so it depends on who, who you're doing it with. Like, uh, you know, when I was going through uh, UCSB, um, it was all academia that I would go and do my excavations for credit. Uh, currently, it's either teaming up with uh, the right anthropologist or archaeologist, or if I'm doing something on my own in regards to ufology or, you know, the high strangeness, there, there's no way they're going to give you permission for that. So the only way that I can get the data points I need is to be able to look into the ground without them really knowing I'm doing it. And, you know, that's having the correct type of gradiometers or um, other equipment that can, with the proper software, turn it into 3D ground imaging. Okay, so you can't actually do any kind of uh, research with anything that might... um, you know, say, dig into the soil. So you almost have to do ground penetrating radar or something of that nature. It, right. a non-invasive, so, non-invasive in other words. Right. In Mexico, you know, even if it's your home and you find something in the ground, it's property of the government, not yours. But I mean, we're talking about Mexico, so yeah. <laughs> it, it's pretty limited. It, does it really matter? I mean, you know, people are you know, digging stuff up every day and selling it on the black market. Um, And and then, like, in regards to these uh, ancient alien artifacts that are coming out of, like, Oelos de Jalisco, um, you know, these are supposedly thousands of years old with uh, glyphs uh, showing what looked to be, you know, I guess what you would consider extraterrestrial. But since the government doesn't consider it an actual artifact, or archaeological object, um, they believe them faked, they don't care, and you're allowed to keep it, sell it, do whatever you want with it. So, so it really all depends on, on just so many you know, different factors. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, when you're out on places like uh, out in Utah, at either the Skinwalker Ranch or the Blind Frog Ranch out in those areas, because they're privately owned, you're able to use more invasive. Because I've, I've watched both programs, and, you know, they get out there with diggers and loaders and backhoes and drills and everything else. Um, the non-invasive things, such as ground-penetrating radar and so forth, that you use, is that probably a little more effective uh, to use before they go digging out there? Because, you know, a lot of people do that. They, they start digging first before looking underneath the soil. So do, would you say that that's probably more of effective before they go <laughs> digging up, you know, a, a square block of 
of Earth just to find something? Yeah, and that's exactly what you would do is you'd bring in these magnetometers, uh, ground penetrating radar, and you would, uh, you know, look into the ground, uh, get initial readings, initial scans, give you a better idea of where to dig. And like you said, uh, you know, in, in Utah, it's private property. You can dig wherever you want. Uh, there's limitations, obviously, like on Blind Frog Ranch, uh, because there are creeks running through the property um, that deal with the Army Corps uh, of Engineers and the state of Utah. Uh, there are certain points even on private property that you cannot dig or alter due to that, but the rest is fair game if you own it. Now, I remember correctly, um, the last time that I saw one of the episodes where you were on the Skinwalker Ranch, you came onto the property with some type of equipment and an analysis that said that there was a connection between that ranch and other locations via those underground streams and underground caverns? Right, and that's the theory that I'm promoting is, uh, well, what you saw there was a vector magnetometer, okay. um, a directional magnetometer, which uh, gives magnetic reading, you know, to the Earth's core using micro Tesla. And, well, th well, that's what you read in is micro Tesla. And... Uh, you know, we're talking about hundreds upon hundreds of data points that I've collected at many, many different sites, including Blind Frog Ranch, uh, Skinwalker Ranch, surrounding ranches, the mesa north of it, up in the mountains. And there are, or it, there is this huge cavern void tunnel system running throughout the Uintah Basin and the mountains. And you know, at some point, uh, it may not still be, but they were obviously connected and used by the Native Americans or other indigenous people that were there in the area. You know, there's a lot of um, oral tradition with the Native Americans going back that uh, even the Aztec and Toltec culture originated from Utah. And from a lot of the information and the research I've done, I, I'm a firm believer that that's what occurred now, is there any correlation between those underground caverns and uh, ley lines? Are there ley lines through that area? Uh, I apologize. I, you cut out. I think you were, were you asking me if there's correlation with ley lines and the tunnel system? Yes. So uh, I, I'm always hesitant to believe in the ley lines. Um, I've I've seen data on them, and it almost seems like somebody could put them anywhere they want. But that being said, if I don't know if you've noticed this, but a lot of these maps showing these ley lines seem to show this huge evolution of them coming out of Salt Lake City, Utah, and running throughout Utah. So maybe there is a correlation between that. Um, you know, there is these huge transient. Um, high energy readings throughout the basin. Um, I personally believe that, you know, the possibility of where this energy comes from could have been a meteor or an asteroid strike in the past. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I mean, I, I guess that's possible. If you look at uh, what other people have put out on these ley lines, they do match up with the location. Then there's also the um, you you have Yellowstone up in that area too, uh, which is a nice big you know underground massive super volcano. Um, so you have mag magma flow and uh, a lot of different things going on back there. It seems to be kind of busy energy wise. Yeah, agreed. That there's a uh, there's just a uh, you you got to remember that. Um, the ancient, uh, the Eocene Lake Uinta used to be there, and this covered uh, part of Colorado and a part of Utah. That's how big it was. It was a thousand feet deep, and um, you know, if a meteor or asteroid struck during that time, it could have helped in covering it up. 
and it being more difficult to see or like what you said there there's a lot of hydrocarbons in the area on the uinta basin uh, natural gas you know the petroleum oil and also a very unique product that's known as gilsonite which is a hardened hydrocarbon which has these amazing and very unique properties and it's only found in three parts of the world and it looks like it was created in those three parts of the world because of some type of meteor or asteroid strike hitting the hydrocarbons that were in the ground. Wow. Yeah, that, it kind of looks – Gilsonite kind of looks like a um, uh, a tarish sort of material, almost volcanic. Yeah, so in its hardened state, it looks like obsidian. Yeah. And then it is considered an asphalt type. Um, okay. So exactly like you said, like an, uh, it is in that same family. Okay. Makes total sense. Ouch. Sorry, Tabby, I stepped on a question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, ah, this stuff is amazing. Um, Oops. Still because it's interesting to, um, to look at what you're doing there at well anybody doing lidar for example uh, and i noticed in in that show and other shows that are using this technology that it seems to just show up as a little bit of like a, a ripple underground and you have to sit there and analyze to try to figure out what exactly it is uh, and it must have you just scratching your head a lot of the times going, well, it's something down there, but we don't know what. And if I can't dig, I can't tell you what it is. That, that, that's right. You, you know, sometimes it's frustrating because uh, I've used the, the the equipment quite a bit. And, you know, the information that you gain from it is supposed to be similar, if not the exact same. But uh I know it's cliche, but, you know, Skinwalker Ranch presents some just unique opportunity in the way data points are created or how they they turn out that is unique. Uh, I mean, I, I've seen it at some other interesting locations and sites. So uh, there has to be something um, in regards to these high strangeness locations that we're just missing. And I think that the technology that we now have, and hopefully in the future, the near future, uh, will pri provide us with the ability to at least see it, better understand it, maybe collect data from it and analyze it better. Um, I'm really promoting recently that I really think that uh, thermal imaging should be used day and night uh, at both shows. Uh, you know, mystery at Blind Frog Ranch and uh, secret at Skinwalker Ranch, because I think we're missing certain parts of the light spectrum that we're not able to see with, you know, our eyes that maybe some of this high strangeness, this phenomena is occurring where we might be able to pick it up with thermal imaging. Well, didn't they do that on the Skinwalker Ranch at that one, uh, that one area? Uh, they had a thermal imaging, and they had, I believe, a, a tribal shaman. Or, no, excuse me, I beg your pardon. It was uh, a rabbi that was uh, saying prayers, and it opened what they said was a portal. And right in front of that area, everything just suddenly turned a different color. I mean, that yeah, definitely that... shows a, a shift in in uh, and not only the temperature and everything. So if that happens because, you know, if it manifests or something because of that, think of what it would do if you weren't necessarily around and paying a whole lot of attention. Because a lot of stuff happens when you're not paying attention. You know, it, it, the paranormal field, you turn your, your back and stuff happens. It, unless you have a camera or something on it, you're not going to catch it. Yeah, and you're exactly right. I mean, that that's a perfect example of what happened at Homestead, too. Yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, with that thermal imaging, they believe what they captured was uh, an opening of a portal. They noticed this huge temperature decrease around where the portal formation was taking place. 
and the LIDAR that was being used worked perfectly except inside of that Homestead 2 building where this portal supposedly was captured. So l like I said, I'm, I'm in total agreement. I think uh, thermal imaging uh, really should be used day and night in those locations um, just because I, I bet you, uh, and I, I mean, you see it in all the, you know, on Facebook and everything like that, people talking about it, and, and they're absolutely right. It's just a matter of uh, being able to collect the data and analyze it, and you need the proper equipment for that. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering if anybody has also used full spectrum cameras as opposed to thermal yes. imaging. I think they do. Yeah, so. Uh, Eric Bard, who is the uh, lead investigator that works for Brandon Fugel, he, he's there on the ranch quite a bit. And, you know, we only get this little glimpse on the show of what's taking place. But you got to remember that they're collecting data and they're using high end equipment 24 7. Okay. It's just you could never provide all the data points that are captured to the public. Sure. Yeah. And it also must be frustrating for everybody that data that was captured prior to the, the now ownership um, is um, not available. Yeah, um, we're talking about NIDS and Bass and Bigelow. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's a sore spot with me because it, you know, it just means that you have to reinvent the wheel and, and for them having conducted, you know, investigation with NIDS from 94 uh, all the way through 2016 with the bass. It, it's just ridiculous. But I mean, at the same time, I understand most of that was done with government money. You know, there were a lot of uh, non disclosure agreements signed, sure. government agreements. So um, th that's with any government contract like that. There's certain things that aren't going to be disclosed to the public. And, you know, for me, it kind of sucks that it happens to deal with, you know, one of the main topics that. I spend a great deal of my daily life, uh, you know, investigating and researching. Oh, well, you know, but if you're looking at it from a scientific study, uh, for somebody to say, uh, yeah, I did that, I did that experiment 20 years ago, but I'm not going to let you have the data for it. Um, and it's kind of not how science is supposed to work. Yeah. yeah kind of makes you scratch your head thinking, well, what in the world did they find out that they don't want everybody else to know? I'm not so sure they found that much. That's why they don't want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so just the opposite. Oh, we didn't find anything, but we're going to make it sound like an intrigue. <laughs> but you, you, we're looking at all these data points and, and all the strange energies that's happening there. Um, do you think that it's sort of is it a causation that's causing some of these cryptid sightings or is it something else? So, so, so uh, the, uh, and, and the anomalies are, are the anomalies causing the, ter the cryptid sightings or are the cryptids causing the anomalies? Yeah. And that's, you know, uh, just something I can't answer in my presentations that I give at the conferences. It, it, it could go either way. It are it, is this high strangeness and all this phenomena attracted to the energy, or are they causing the energy? Mm -hmm. And re in reality, um, yeah. I firmly believe that there is some type of energy source underground, uh, be it in a void or a cavity si system. Uh, there is, you know pretty moderate saline water running through the ground to, and there's a lot of quartz, you know, in the crisp, in the, the ground, there's this gilsonite, which is a great, uh, you know, it, it insulates can cause that energy to go greater distances. And it seems to be connecting to something that's above the Mesa and the ranch. So are we talking you know, something transmitting from point A to B and then B to C in an upward direction, or is it the opposite way, or is it multiple? It, it just, we don't know yet. Well, now, I'd never heard of uh, Blind Frog Ranch. Uh, is the same stuff supposed to be going on there as the other one, or 
it, are they totally two different things with what's supposed to be happening? Sure. So Discovery Channel has a show. It's Mystery at Blind Frog Ranch. Uh, they had season one. Uh, I believe production on season two started on Monday. And the, the main connection in that is there looks to be a gold cache site uh, buried somewhere on the property that may very well have something to do with the Azteca or even the ancestors of the Aztec. And it even looks from the research I've done that we're looking at two different things. We're looking at a cash mine, uh, meaning where all this uh, gold that's already been processed has been placed. And then this origination point that's called Karshinab, which may very well have been a place where the ancestors went to survive a major catastrophic event. And it was solid gold or other precious metals with it. And as that population increased, they had to keep removing the ore from Karshanab and placing it into this other location. And so they're focusing in on this gold hunt. Um, Dwayne Ollinger, who is the owner of the ranch, believes that it's a, a, a cash mine that they're going to find bullion but there also seems to be a lot of mines uh, where gold can you know gold ore can be uh, mined as well from the beginning to be smelted to be processed but at the same time there are these auras of this blue light that come up out of the ground supposedly people have supposedly been healed of some pretty big ailments in the pond that is there They've uh, located an underground uh, void or cavern system that's completely filled with water. And Dwayne is just recently at the Laughlin UFO Mega Conference in June of last, well, June last month. Uh, he discussed how there were nine UFOs that showed up over a hillside. They were cloaked in like this cloud, uh, like a cloud cloaking device, and that there was a blue dirt that they found when they dug 75 feet down that created ball lightning phenomenon lit up the hillside in this blue aura and he's stating that you know the ufos were attracted to this and there also seems to be this united galactic federation that has been in contact with him as well and it was really an interesting presentation that he gave um, just to show that you know, the Uintah Basin and the Uintah Mountains are, is just uh, just this area of high strangeness. And there's so many moving pieces, um, you know, not just with the ufology involved um, and the paranormal, but also with this ancient history that may very well be below our feet there. Well, the, the ancient history that you're referring to, um, especially on places like Skinwalker Ranch, with the Ute Indian, they are the ones that, um, aren't they pretty much the only ones in the area that have the Skinwalker uh, legend or however way you want to put it, but it's within their, uh, their belief system. And that the Skinwalker Ranch itself is having so much activity on it, not just UFOs, but, uh, you know, cattle mutilations and things like that. But when it comes to the actual Skinwalkers, I have been reading an awful lot, and I certainly, you know, have read uh, your last two books, where there might be a connection between the Skinwalkers and these possible energy portals. That And all the readings and everything that they're getting off of both ranches, especially Skinwalker, that that's where a lot of this comes into play, that the Skinwalkers are not necessarily part of our dimension, but of another that have come out of a portal. Is, is that something that, that you have run across an awful lot in your research? 
So the the Yinod Lushi are the skinwalkers. They're uh, Navajo, Diné. Oh, Navajo. And what what occurred, or, or supposedly the way that the the mythology or the oral tradition goes, is that the Ute kicked the Navajo out. And you have to remember that the Navajo and the Cher- uh, the Apache are are fairly new to the area. They came down from the north. Uh, the Ute, the tribes that make up and the bands that make up the Ute have been there for a while, uh, at least longer than the Navajo. And when the Navajo came in. They fought, and the Ute made them leave. It was during course of war. And supposedly the Navajo cursed the Ute with the, the skinwalker, the Yinod Lushi, which are these supposed uh, medicine men that have gone bad. They practice adishkash and sympathetic magic. Um, and... What they do, uh, or how they do it, if it just depends on who you talk to in the Native American community, uh, whether that be from you know interdimensional realms or other world, uh, how they get their power of being able to shape shift, or if they're able to go in and out of portals, but. Over the course of the last year, I've also brought up the point that, you, you know, what if we're talking about a secret society of Native Americans that are mimicking or using this skinwalker as a way of providing cover for whatever they're protecting below ground, um, whether that be an energy source or this Karshanab um, and and what is there? You know, is it uh, technology? Is it uh, a natural phenomena? Um, and, and when we're discussing the portals that are occurring, and you have to remember that when we're talking about portals, you even have people like Colonel Alexander saying that what is occurring at Skinwalker Ranch are portals. So is this a, a gateway that... You know, we've lost sight of how it's used uh, based on a catastrophic event in the past or, or just lost historical data, which the Native Americans have never lost. You know, their oral tradition, they just uh, have passed it down differently. Instead of writing it down, it's been from, you know, by word of mouth. Right. And yeah, I've recently changed my perspective, and I, I really do believe this is a group of Native Americans that are in some type of secret society that are protecting something that they know about, and they're using the skinwalker because, I mean, think about it. You, you know, when the, the sun goes down and you're on the Uinta Basin, if you're by yourself and you've heard anything about this, any little movement or an animal that runs by, what do you immediately start thinking about? Sure. Sure. I'm going to think of a coyote. <laughs> I, I thought it would be more likely to be afraid of a coyote than anything else. Yeah, I, I don't know how you feel about Carlos Castaneda, but he also had theories about these types of portals um, and these types of shamans who – who would do things along this sort of same sort of line, right? I, I apologize. You cut out there for oh, a moment. Oh, sorry. Because <laughs> we're talking about, yeah. Um, I don't know how you feel about Carlos Castaneda, uh, but he also had that same sort of, of theory, I think, um, with the idea of portals uh, and these sorcerers being able to slip in and out of them. Yeah, if we're talking about, uh, you know, something that we're just not yet aware of or we've forgotten, um, you, we can see and look at portals, you know, either being some type of natural phenomena or some type of technology. And somebody has to know how to use that. Uh, and, you know, has it been passed down uh, from a medicine man to medicine man or a certain uh, hierarchy in the Native American culture. 
uh, I think that's a possibility. And, and I think that, um, you know, the energy that is there at the ranch and at other parts of the Uintah Basin, I, I think it could all easily be tied in, you know, as um, possible causation of uh, a portal system. I, I mean, I guess it's it's very possible. Sure. Uh, I mean, none of those traditions are are written down. All, all of them are passed down orally, right? So you could have people who figured out how to use that. Let's call it a transportation system or a portal system, and simply pass it on to certain people. I mean, that does make sense. Yeah, I, and and you know it's interesting too in the petroglyphs and pictographs that are there on the Uinta Basin. You're talking about three. Most of them, a majority of them, are from three ancient um, cultures. Uh, there are some more recent by the Navajo and the Ute uh, and some other bands, but you're talking about the Fremont, the Barrier Canyon style, and a third group that anthropologists really know nothing about, so they've labeled them unknown culture um, because they really haven't found any living sites uh, with artifacts to be able to give them a name. Really? And Oh, yeah. And when you look at this, we're talking about probably anywhere from 800 years ago, which would have been the Fremont, all the way back to thousands of years, maybe seven, 8,000 years ago uh, with Barrier Canyon. And in these petroglyphs, it's really interesting because there looks to be um, a number or a math system involved that is very similar to the Maya of lines and uh, circles. Um and when you add them up, they come up to some interesting uh, data points, especially if you look at the anthropomorphic creatures that are around them. You also, in Barrier Canyon style, which is there on the basin and uh, south uh, through all of southern Utah, you see these anthropomorphic creatures that are very, very large. Uh, some of them are 9, 10 feet tall on the rock art. They seem to be hovering above the ground. They look to have technology all around on their person. Some have three digits on their hand instead of the normal five or four or six. And it makes you really wonder if we're talking about an ancient uh, species of giants or artificial intelligence that they saw. They didn't know what it was or maybe they did. But that was their way of historically um, putting it down for, you know, future posterity was in the rock art. And it, it's just very interesting um, when you go to these sites. It, it's it's not something you see everywhere else uh, in regards to other rock art or from other you know tribes or cultures. That's true. I remember other um, First Nation cultures that do have giant mythology, um, and I know it, it's it's indicative of North America, and I guess if you want to include Goliath, um, parts of the Middle East as well. Um, are you finding that in uh, in anything that you're doing, say, in Mexico? Yep, 100 percent. So. Uh, my big push is the giants were everywhere. I can prove it. Uh, I have collected so much research, uh, through research, so much data, um, not just from oral tradition or interviews, but, you know, from uh, codices that uh, remain, which are very few. Those are the, the books from the Mesoamerican cultures, from petroglyphs, pictographs, artifacts, uh, site locations. The giants were everywhere. Even the Navajo uh, talk about the Starnock, uh, which were these mi these giants that were miners, and they enslaved the uh, Native Americans, the other people around them, to work in these mines. And what's interesting is they used technology that made sound. So are we talking about pneumatic, electric? You know, was it vibrational? And... Uh, you got to wonder too, like at places like Karshanab at Blind Frog Ranch, are we talking about giants having, you know, survived, been considered gods by the other indigenous people? Um, and 
at some point they fought back and made them go extinct. Because remember, too, uh, as a, a catastrophic event took place, not many giants survived. So they started mating with Homo sapiens sapien, and they reduced in size until we see what the Paiute call, the, the Paiute Indians called the Siteka, which were the red-headed cannibal giants. And according to John T. Reed, um, and all he documented over, you know, this huge amount of time from the 1880s until 1942 or 43 when he passed away, those Siteka were not killed off by uh, the other Indians, the other Native Americans, until about 1760 to 1764, which is pretty recent. Wow. Oh, boy. So we're not talking, um, say, Viking or um, Northern Europeans coming through uh, and trying to colonize the United States, uh, which is about the only red-haired people I can think of normally. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're talking um, basically very ancient culture here. Absolutely. And when you look at the, uh, again, when you look at the rock art, it almost looks like these men or these people of great stature were coming through what looked to be portals. And it's interesting because when you look at the latitude location of uh, the Uinta Basin, it lines up perfect to the T with the island of Sardinia. And guess what really? Sardinia is very famous for? Giants. Yeah. Uh, the neuragic culture, which lived on Sardinia five, 6,000 years ago, they were considered a Bronze Age culture. They said that the giants, you know, were there before them. They dominated the world. Towards the end, when they started populating more and more, it was the decline of this great stature species. And is there a possibility? Uh, was it just seafaring or was there this possibility that there are certain locations around the world that had an ability, a site to site um, on Earth to connect with some type of um, portal system or gateway? Uh, and are these areas that have these these anomalies of these magnetic anomalies or these high electromagnetic anomalies or gravitational issues that we're seeing at certain locations. And it, I just find that very interesting that like on the Uinta Basin, you have these grav gravitational issues, electromagnetic field issues, magnetic issues. Well, I mean, you would probably need something like that for a portal system. So what, what kind of uh, distance is there between uh, the Blind Frog Ranch and Skinwalker Ranch? Uh, the two are 21 miles apart. Uh, so if you're at Blind Frog Ranch, you have to drive 21 miles northeast. Uh, Blind Frog Ranch is right at the base where the Uinta Basin turns into the Uinta Mountains in La Pointe, Utah. Hmm. So I have uh, a quick thing about the giants. I came across some documentaries that indicate that uh, what giant skeletons and have been archaeologically dug up that have been brought to the Smithsonian, and then the Smithsonian conveniently says, "Oh, what what skeletons? We don't we don't have any record of skeletons you gave us," and it's like there that secret is being hidden as well. Yeah, I heard about that. You know, the, with all the the uh, pictographs and everything that you're referring to, James, it. I noticed that a lot of them, while they are showing very, very large people, a lot of these uh, large people have rather unusual stature, like uh, almost like they're wearing uh, like armor or very weird looking costumes. And sometimes they're wearing some rather strange things on their heads. And people look at them and say, oh, well, that's a spaceman, you know, because he's wearing a helmet or something. Um, if they are quite possibly other beings from other dimensions, is it possible that these giants are actually another race from somewhere out in space that just happened to stop by and decide to... <laughs> 
take up shop. And they were scattered all over the world with the same basic knowledge. And all of these uh, native peoples just saw them as being, you know, almost like supreme beings, like gods and so forth. Yeah, it's uh, very possible. As a matter of fact, with the Starnock uh, from the Navajo uh, oral tradition, they said that um, those that didn't go extinct may have very well returned to the stars. So, I, I mean, how you interpret that could fit right along what you were saying. Yeah. Why All not? Right. They, their, their business was done. Um, and, you know, eventually, you know, the mothership just came back and said, you know, hey, it, it, you've done what you needed to. Let's, it's time to go. Or maybe by the time that it was time for these giants to just suddenly disappear, that they were some of the ones that went through some of these interdimensional portals and not into a spaceship. All right. We're going to have exactly. to uh, take our break uh, now because Jeff is going to have to uh, run out for a, for a little bit and then he'll be back. Uh, so with that, Jeff, you want to take us out to a break? Yes. You're listening to the paranormal view on para com with your hosts, Henry Foister, Seal and Cat Barbara Duncan, Tabby Cat Gash, and myself, Jeffrey Gould, with tonight's guest, James Keenan. So stay tuned for more of the Paranormal View after the break. Whether you're listening at home, at work, or anywhere, thanks for making Para-X part of your day. Your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. And welcome back, everybody, right here to the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. I want to thank everyone for being with us tonight. Those here in the chat room and those listening from around the world, we appreciate each and every one. Tonight we have with us Barbara Duncan. Hello, everyone. And we got uh, I don't know Jeff back yet. Nope. Okay, we got uh, Tabby Cat. How are you doing, everybody? And since uh, Jeff ain't back. Uh, you want to go ahead and uh, introduce our guest then. Welcoming back. Yes, tonight our very special guest is James Keenan, and we are currently talking with him about all the various different uh, anomalies and mysteries on the Skinwalker Ranch and the Blind Frog Ranch. Well, welcome back. Thanks. All right. And I just uh, put on my Kindle list, uh, shoplifting in a paranormal zone. I can't wait to <laughs> read that one. <laughs> uh, you got a lot of books. All right. A, a uh, lot of stuff seems to be going on uh, between the two ranches. And is a lot of it similar or totally two different things going on? You, you know, uh, that's a good question. And from what I'm doing on Blind Frog Ranch is more of the historical uh, data based on the possibility of there being Mesoamerican connections, uh, specifically Toltec and Azteca Uh I'm more interested in that aspect up there in regards to the underground cavern systems, the cavities, the voids, and the this location that I believe is known as Karshanab, which I personally believe is where the ancients survived an ancient catastrophic event and rose up out of the ground at some point, and this uh, became more of a shrine that's being protected. Uh, I believe there is a cash system of gold there that not just the Spaniards pulled from, but the Mexicans and then the Mormons. And then at Skinwalker Ranch, it's uh, more in regards to what this energy is, what its focus or origin point is, and what uh, high strangeness and unexplainable phenomena it's creating or is it that uh, the phenomena is coming to it? So 
it, it, it's a little bit of both because you also talk about Blind Frog Ranch where Dwayne just recently, you know, told everybody about the UFOs that show up there quite a bit and this galactic federation that's very interested in the property. Yeah. Well, isn't gold supposed to be one of the best conductors for things that, you know, that would be a quite a big draw for anybody, Earth or otherwise? Absolutely. If you have a huge, say, a, a, an asteroid struck uh, and a large part of that asteroid was a big, uh, big piece of gold and that happens to, you know, be under or around Blind Frog Ranch, and that may be where these ancestors survived by uh, going underground in it. And as their population increased, they had to keep pulling that gold out and storing it elsewhere. And some of that oral tradition states that uh, where Toat, their god, uh, protected them, that the walls are lined in gold. Well, the only way I could think of doing that is that this was one huge gold rock that, you know, as the population increased, they pulled it out until the the end game was that all the walls were lined in gold. And yeah, I mean, think about that. It could actually be a reason for a lot of the, the readings that we're getting uh, in regards to magnetic uh, anomalies or EMF you know, the, the, I, I don't know if it would uh, deal as much with the RF, the, the radio frequency issues, but um, I mean, having a lot of metals could play into that as well. Yeah, but gold isn't magnetic. So what else, I mean, is I don't know much about metallurgy, but it, uh, do we also find platinum in asteroid content? What we're finding, uh, there's high volumes of platinum in certain locations on the ranch, but what we're also finding is iridium. And when I'm talking a lot of iridium, when you consider the standard amount of iridium in the in a piece of the ground that you pick up is one one thousandth part per million in a meteorite that has iridium, we usually find 4.5 to 6 parts per million. Uh On the samples that I took from Blind Frog Ranch at three locations, I was coming up with the XRF gun between 10 and 60 parts per million. Oh, man. It's huge. And if you watched the show, they found, uh, they sampled a part of i believe it was from the 75 foot uh, hole they drilled and it came up 870,000 parts per million oh my god <laughs> so what well, is that really used for uh iridium is a very rare metal used in all types of uh, industry and it if I remember properly, I, I believe it's three thousand or thirty-two hundred dollars per ounce oh, compared man. to the gold, which is a I think as of Friday was eight eighteen hundred dollars per ounce. Um, but you know, you you find it in in the usages are in all, all types of industries, and it's a very very rare. It's a rare metal. Yeah. Hmm. Is it used in uh, like the space programs? Is it used for or nuclear? Can, do they use iridium in nuclear? You know, I, I'm not sure if they use it. That, that's kind of out of my my jurisdiction. Yeah, <laughs> but I've it would studied. make a lot of sense though if there if there's metals in the ground uh, in these locations, and it's in such high. Uh, density or in a large quantity, you got to figure that somebody's going to be wanting that stuff. And if they want to protect it, if they don't want people to get to it, there's going to be things on that land that are going to protect it. Like, say, skinwalkers. They're, they're wanting to keep people away from it. 
keep their hands off of it. Exactly. Hmm. Huh. A lot of it's starting to, you know, a lot of these dots are starting to get connected here. Well, it kind of goes back to your theory of that secret society of of groups that are wanting to keep people away from it by any means necessary. So, I mean, it does make sense that you're getting sure. too close and we're going to try to scare you away. <laughs> yeah, what better right. way and, to and do think that? About it. What were the giants mining? Yeah. Huh. Hmm. Wow. Very true. Well, you know, there's First Nation tribes in Maine and New England uh, that also have that giant theory. And almost every single one of them uh, says they retreated to caves. So it, it would make sense that they're doing something mining-wise or trying to find something that's underground. And what it, most geologists will tell you, that's where pretty much everything is. Uh, very little of it is surface uh, metals um, or ores. So. so with with all this and possible mining, somebody's looking for something. Has there been a report very much of UFOs there? So are we talking about, uh, I apologize, you cut out a bit there. Are you talking oh. about Blind Frog Ranch or the whole basin? The whole basin, including uh, Skinwalker. I mean, if there's if that stuff's real valuable and not just money-wise, but used for different things, uh, has there been any reports of aliens or UFOs also seeking it or already know where it's at? Well, that's an interesting question to ask because, you know, the Utah Basin is what many consider a UFO alley. Right. Um, you're talking one of the highest amount of sightings uh, since the. Well, as a matter of fact, I just recently came across an article from uh, July 10th of 1947 from the Uintah County uh, newspaper. And it talked about uh, flying discs seen in Vernal and Artesia. And this was, what was it, a three- or four-week period where over a 1,000 sightings took place, including the famous Roswell crash was, what, three days before, I think, on yeah. the 7th of July. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it makes you wonder, you know, what the hell are they doing there? Well, maybe it's the same thing that we're attracted to, they're attracted to. And Dwayne did say that nine UFOs were cloaked in this cloud-like cloaking technology that appeared directly above the hillside where uh, the blue dirt is found. And that location happens to be the highest content of the iridium and other precious metals. Unfortunately, I, I can't discuss everything that's been found there. I can't talk about the iridium, though, because it was on the show. Yeah. Now, now has anybody done geological surveys then? Um, because Mexico City also has an extremely high... Um, reporting levels of uh, UFOs. Um, are we seeing similar types of of geological data that indicate that they're looking for something very specific? You know, I've never researched uh, that, but I mean, it seems like a possibility. It always seems that when you look at where this highest degree of UFO sightings are, um, why are they focused on these certain locations? The areas always tend to turn out somewhat unique in regards to uh, what's below them, you know, in regards to precious metals or hydrocarbons or, you know, other material. Like, I mean, look at the Gilsonite, how important it is. And... Um, you know, uh, since, you know, before it was Mexico City, when it was Tenochtitlan, I mean, there were some unique properties uh, in the location of current Mexico City. Hmm. Okay. Since you've been to Skinwalker and uh, over to Blind Frog, have you ever seen um, any UFOs? there in those areas uh, i have not no um now 16 miles east of uh, skinwalker ranch there is an abandoned nassau site 
Uh, it's closer to vernal. And uh, I, I do a lot of uh, ground penetrating radar over the old site because I'm pretty convinced that it was there for other reasons. And I actually just found, I think it was a 1966 or 68 report um, from a Air Force base in New Mexico that was talking about it uh, conducting top secret research on uh, sonic booms and sound waves from uh, certain uh, aircraft that was top secret for the United States at the time that no one knew about. And I have seen uh, an orange orb and a white orb that I interacted with over the NASA site when I was using KA band uh, radar gun, which was uh, operating at 34.15 gigahertz at the time. Um, and again, I think that's 16 miles east of Skinwalker Ranch and 19 miles south east of Blind Frog Ranch. Now, by interacting, what do you mean? Sure. So I wanted to test uh, and see if these objects were solid objects, if they would have a surface that uh, radar could uh, you know, bounce off of. Okay. And I'm uh, with a law enforcement background. You know, I, I, I was thinking, you know, everybody uses video, but nobody believes video anymore. So what could I, what new data points could I collect that could maybe uh, be a little different in, in uh, changing how we uh, capture the, this phenomena? So I tested it by doing the same thing that I did as a police officer when you drove by speeding. And um, sure enough, uh, I initially used a laser uh a stalker laser radar gun, and it had uh, no effect um, with the orbs. The, the orbs did nothing. And then when I changed over to a KA band, uh, that's a 34.15 gigahertz microwave frequency, uh, the moment I uh, clicked it on, I had it on POP, which is a uh, a way that it keeps from being able to be monitored. So if you have a radar detector and the officer's trying to be a little tricky, he'll have it on pop and it instantly turns off and on. So it's harder for the detector to pick it up. When I hit the orb with that, it immediately started conducting maneuvers attempting to get away from uh, the radar that I was putting out the, the frequency hmm. and I tracked it anywhere from 11 miles per hour to 44 miles per hour between 315 feet. And I think it was 601 or 602 feet until wow. uh, the orb dropped off the side of the, the Mesa and, and down past the horizon. Hmm. Wow. Okay. So it definitely knew you were scanning it. It, exactly. It, it, and what's amazing is it obviously had a surface that uh, returned a uh, reading to the, the radar, the ATR stalker radar guy. Right. Yeah. Wow. Oh, well, it certainly isn't ball lightning and it certainly isn't swamp gas. <laughs> it, exactly. And, and that was, uh, and remember too, that you have to understand I, I'm, crazy interested in this site so i've been there so many times and i've only captured the phenomena three times well that's still pretty good yeah, i mean yeah. that's that's pretty good i mean how many times have people gone on to either one of these ranches especially skinwalker and claim that they've seen ufos and people go out there and they might even spend a week and not see one single strange light in the sky and the moment they leave Somebody says, hey, I just saw one last night. And you go, oh, man, <laughs> why did that happen? Talk about timing. Wow. But I, I agree with you that right in the very beginning, you, you said that they really should be setting up uh, thermal cameras on a regular basis. Because uh, with all the various different things that have happened on that ranch, you know, like the cattle mutilations and um, – I think they had alpacas out there at one time that got attacked, but they figured in the long run that was by a, an animal. But still, thermal cameras are going to pick up um, just about anything that isn't uh, within the normal range of, of heat. 
because you know being out in the desert it's the surrounding rocks and anything else that is going to hold on to heat are going to retain that that heat for a period of time and then once it starts cooling off then the temperature is going to kind of level out and then you're going to see the normal critters that come out you know the, the coyotes and and anything else that that might be out there and certainly if even though Skinwalker has people that go out there with guns, I don't know if they do it at night or not, but they try to keep, you know, a lot of people off of the area for a lot of obvious reasons. But if anybody is getting onto that ranch and doing something on the ranch, that thermal is going to pick them up and it's going to be noticeable what it is. And if it's something like a Skinwalker if it's got any kind of form, if it's got any kind of heat and signature, it's going to show up. So I, I agree right. with you. It, they should have 24-7 surveillance out there in, in one well, form re- or another. Remember, too, when Nids was out there in uh, Colm Kelleher and uh, George Knapp's book, Hunt for the Skinwalker, uh, when the two, uh, I think that it was two scientists from Nids were up on the Skinwalker Ridge one had infrared goggles and the other did not. And the portal opened up and this giant black creature came up out of the portal and walked off, I believe, on all fours into the out into the field. And the individual that didn't have the goggles said he only could see a, a light. And then the light was gone. But yeah. the guy with the infrared goggles was freaking out because he sees this portal open up and this thing come out of it, you know, and that right there just tells you that, you know, what are we missing in regards to, you know, the light spectrum that, you know, we can see versus what we can't, but that we have the technology now to monitor it or, or give us the ability to see using that technology. Uh-huh. I mean, yeah. even within the paranormal field of, um, you know, Henry knows this, Barbara knows it, and, and Jeff knows it. We all know this, that if you're conducting an investigation, especially outdoors, you have to rule out the possibility that there's something natural around you. So if you have neither um, night vision or, um, uh, you know, the uh, thermal imaging, in order to rule out the possibility that that's just plain wildlife that's making that noise, um, you know, walking around or, you know, cracking a, a branch or something, you've got to rule that out because, <laughs> like you said, you go, you go off into a location with a preconceived notion that it's either haunted or it's got some sort of cryptid or whatever on it. Every time you hear something snap or crackle or move, the first, what are you going to think of? That's the first thing. And using one of those two things, thermal or night vision, is going to rule out the possibility that it's not just a natural wildlife phenomenon. Exactly. Of course, my my thoughts always go to foxes, especially when there are screams. Mm. That's the most hideous thing I've ever heard in my life. Sounds like a woman being murdered. (laughs) Well, as I recall, most of the people Uh. that are on the ranch now are lived in the area um, most of their lives so they pretty much know most of the natural sounds that are out there uh, including all the critters so um, if they're starting to say I don't recognize that noise <laughs> it'd be more than welcome to to listen to them um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the geology of the area I mean it is a basin and it seems to me that a lot of it, do you think, could be like it's acting like a parabolic dish? And it's generating? Yes. Pretty? Very much so. And how it gained that uh, shape, uh, I think it's two possibilities, either from the, the Eocene Lake Uinta or a large asteroid's impact. Huh. Wow. And there's no volcanic uh, geology around there, right? Other than uh, none that I 
I'm aware of. There is a quaternary fault line uh, just to the west uh, that has rarely been examined, and uh, it, it's well past due, they believe, uh, for a, a quake. Um, I do believe that the faults in the area have played a big part in the fissures and the cavern systems. Mm -hmm. You know, I think at some point in the past, these caverns were completely connected for uh, 20 to 25 miles northeast and then, uh, I mean, uh, west to east and then north to south. Uh, I believe they've played a part in opening and at the same time collapsing parts of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, the volcanic activity is very close uh, northward. We're talking about, uh, you know, like you said, a, a mega-sized uh, volcano. Wow. Uh, but also... Uh I know well, if you're from Southern California, you're aware of the, the earthquake faults that are down there. And they've discovered the earthquake lights, um, the sort of like light anomalies that appear right before a major earthquake. Um, and now I'm wondering if that also might play into it, that there's some sort of seismic um, release of not gases, but certainly some sort of magnetic uh, energy that could be released prior to an earthquake going off. Yeah, that, that's very possible. I, I uh, you know, I lived in Texas for a while. I saw the Marfa lights and it always reminds me of uh, that when we discuss uh, the light phenomena that takes place with these fault lines. Uh, Marfa lights. Can you explain that? I'm not familiar with them. Um, yeah, the Marfa lights are out in Marfa, Texas. They're these uh, balls of light that uh, there's a ton of them, and you never know when you're going to see them, and they just seem to be dancing uh, all over the place out in the fields. And I'm pretty sure it's due to that type of phenomena that it, it deals with the faults that are below ground. Okay. Okay. Um I got to ask you this uh, place that I would really have liked to uh, had the chance to be able to go to. Uh, I want to know if you've ever had the chance to go and check it out. And that is Oak Island. Never been there. Uh. But you see, yep. They have a lot of weird geomagnetic energy up there, too. Um, and, you know, I, I check out the NOAA on their website has a um, where you can track the uh, magnetic North Pole. Uh, and it's interesting for Skinwalker Ranch, too, <laughs> um, because it shows you the magnetic lines, the dipoles, whatever, that go and dip around um, the, the North Pole, the magnetic North Pole. And it's fascinating to see if how much that plays into um, a lot of the activity. Uh, you know, we're used to animals acting different right before a thunderstorm or an earthquake. Uh, and if something like that might incite more activity, uh, have you noticed any correlation between um, what your readings are, are pointing to and increased activity yet? Yeah, so the phenomena that I'm aware of and that I've uh, monitored during a thunderstorm or uh, more intense weather, it is more prevalent to show itself. Yeah. Really? So yes. do you think that ionization is part of that? I, I don't know. It, it's really interesting. So I collected uh, four data points. They were uh, with the magnetometer. And what this was was just a, a spot on the surface. And I took several hundred data points. And the standard field reading, so the average microtesla is, say, 48 microtesla for the area on and around Skinwalker Ranch. At these four spots, the magnetic reading was anywhere from a negative 14 microtesla 
all the way up to about 50, which shouldn't happen unless I'm in South America or there is some massive magnet below me. And several months back at one of these locations, the spot was hit directly by a lightning strike, which then hit the building next to it, set it on fire and destroyed it and the RV that was parked outside of it. And it's crazy because just a couple months ago, right next to this, the ground opened up for about 20 or 30 feet and about three to four inches wide. So this was during thunderstorms. And it's just crazy interesting. And then these four points, they line up uh, with GPS at exactly 8.34 degree reading, which is just nuts. Well, lightning is pretty much attracted to uh, metal. You know, that's the reason I stay away from metal during a a thunderstorm and everything. And... uh, I can't help but wonder if uh, uh, the lightning strike, you said it hit this area where this uh, magnetic, um, well, (laughs) anomaly was. If there is something with a great deal of metal in the ground, wouldn't that have attracted that lightning strike? Yeah, that's a great question. Very good possibility. And uh, it's just nuts because if you see the spot, it's right on it. And it makes me wonder, because we get these transient readings, are we looking at some type of technology that's moving underground that's made of metal? (laughs) And is it going through this uh, caverns or voids that are underground? Oh. And, you know, I had a question before to uh, on a different group that um, is it possible that electrostatic buildup could occur uh, with some of the metals that are below? Yeah, I, I believe it's possible. Uh, and again, you're you're talking about the Uintah Basin, especially this location of the basin, just seems to have this right combination of everything, you know, conductivity, uh, uh, piezoelectric uh, energy, um, um, these high magnetic levels, and then the, these great insulators available. So are we channeling the energy? Uh, that's, I, I think that's a great possibility. Interesting. Huh. Now, with your work in Mexico, is it is it along the same lines of, of looking for um, correlations with UFOs and um, these uh, cryptos um, phenomena? So uh, twofold. So uh, again, I, I'm really interested in, in why we lost historical data, and I, it has okay. to deal with catastrophic events. That's number uh, one. Okay. Okay. But it seems like this is always connected somehow to ufology and cryptozoology, or one really? and the, one or both. And I, I'm talking about. Uh, I, I hate to say. It, Extraterrestrial, when I think it would be more interdimensional, would be a greater possibility. Okay. Um, or even maybe that whatever's here was always here or here before us and maybe is still here just elsewhere, maybe below ground. And if so, are we talking about uh, gateways that are able to be used uh, to get from one place to the other? That kind of reminds me, I I don't know, a lot of people probably wouldn't remember it, but there was a television show on years ago called Sliders, where it seemed like they were going back and forth, not only in time, but to different locations and everything, through a vortex, a portal. 
And at that period of time, I remember people watching it and thinking, oh, that is so far-fetched. This is nothing but science fiction. This is ridiculous, but it's entertaining. And now science has actually kind of shown that, you know, you can quite possibly do these sort of things because of now our technology has shown us that uh, space bends, time is relative, and who knows how it actually interacts, you know, together. And if uh, cryptids such as Bigfoot suddenly show up in one spot and then people are looking at it and then the moment they take their eyes away, it's just gone. I mean, it isn't like something that big can just stand behind a tree and disappear. It just disappears altogether. And so there are a lot of people seem to think, well, it's an interdimensional being that somehow or another, it knows where all these portals are in their own territory. And they're able to just kind of get to one. And that's why first they're there, then they're not. I mean, that just is not physically possible, even for something like a bear or something, to just disappear all of a sudden. You see it lumber off. But Bigfoot, it's there. People look away, and it's gone. And there's no way that it could have gotten away that fast. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, that's interesting, too, because NASA is currently monitoring with four satellites above above Earth these locations that are their X points. And there are these portals that open up anywhere from a split second to minutes uh, that open from directly from the sun right to the earth. And they haven't really told us much about their findings, which is unsettling. And if they say that these portals that they know exist right above or outside of the planet, they call them X points, they're split seconds. That's just going along with what you said. It, 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 it's a matter of less than a second. Other times it could be minutes that these are left open. And if we're just now, or NASA is just now for the last, I think it's seven or eight years, investigating these, how long did they know before that they existed? And, you know, the technology, the other um, humanoids that existed before us, you know, how many millions of years were they here before us? Uh, and may already sure. know this technology or how this natural phenomenon works, and then that they're capable of harnessing it or using it. Exactly. Well, did any of your research ever lead towards um, any discussion of disappearance of groups of people prior to these uh, cataclysmic events? I, I'm, like, I apologize. You you cut out again. Could you okay. repeat that? Um, did any of your research ever talk uh, about or discover any writing that people – there might have been mass disappearances of people prior to cataclysmic events, uh, like they're being snatched to prevent them from being killed in these events? So the only one that I have – and remember that I, I collect a lot of this from the Native American culture, and that would be the Hopi. They said that the ant people uh, – pulled them underground to protect them from a major catastrophic event. And while they were underground, and we're talking hundreds of years, they taught them mathematics, um, how to survive in the harsh climate and the change that's going to occur uh, that will be, you know, the surface when they return them. So in regards to that, you know, there it is. I mean, the, the Hopi discussed that specifically. And you know, being from uh, Western culture, we dismiss it. We think that this is just mythology. But I, I think, you know, when you talk about the indigenous people or the Native Americans, I think they have it right and we have it wrong. They're, this is oral tradition. It's not mythology. This is their history. And academia, you know, for good reason, refuses to believe it because they get paid off of refusing to believe it. And I can understand that if, uh, you know, it affects my job, my income, my living, how to support my family. I, I get that. But 
as we advance, you know, uh, and society and civilization grows, we have to be more open to the fact that, you know, the science of yesterday was magic. Uh, so today, what we consider magic, you know, people in hundred, uh, excuse me, what we consider today as science, people a hundred years from now are going to think, you know, that we were crazy. Yeah. You know, you've mentioned um, a word a couple of times that included the name Tesla. And Tesla, Nikola Tesla, was probably one of the most unfortunate but most influential in the scientific world, most unrecognized except for the car nowadays, unfortunately. But if he had lived, if he hadn't had a lot of his um, ideas taken from him and put into other uses, the fact that Tesla was able to at least produce certain electrical impulses, you know, the Tesla coil, he would have come up with Wi-Fi long before it did. And the fact that he was also involved in the Philadelphia experiment. And if the government is still denying the fact that the Philadelphia experiment, experiment really did take place, you know, they're blaming it on other things or saying it was blown out of proportion I can't help but wonder if Tesla wasn't on the right track that he was able to open a portal with his technology. And that's why his um, all of his research and everything was taken after he died. The government and everybody else did not want their hands on this because they either wanted to research it for themselves or they were just flat out scared of it. It frightened them. Yeah, I think they try to weaponize everything they can. Uh huh. Wow. Uh, could you imagine Tesla at Skinwalker Ranch? I think that would be. Oh, interesting. he'd have a ball. Well, yeah, look, they used the Tesla coil uh, on <laughs> on, uh, on the ranch. Oh yeah, that was a cool. Bit, yeah. Well, we had the biggest joke about you know how. Uh, how many of them, after they used the light bulbs, uh, were out there playing Jedi Knight with the lightsabers? <laughs> um, but it brings up a really good point of just how conductive that ground out there is. Um, and it kind of makes me wonder, you know, how much EMF they're um, being subjected to uh, and the fact that that Poor gentleman, is it Tom, I believe, that uh, his scalp was swollen afterwards. Um, that it's almost kind of like a directed, but but only at certain individuals. Yeah, because he right. was affected twice. Yeah. And is it biochemical or is it um, deliberate? Well, yeah, Barbara, it, it, I know from personal experience... I can't be around high EMF. I, I really can't. I, if I go into a location with high EMF, say the electrical box is, is really, you know, wired badly or something like that, I start getting nauseous. I start getting sick. I mean, it starts affecting me in every way you can think of, and I have to leave. I, I can't stand it. Yeah, that's, that's why, why I was why asking I can't before. Be around an yeah. EMF pulp, one of those EMF pumps. Oh, man, I'll get definitely ill being around one of those things. That's what I was asking you before about when you're on the ranch or either ranch, um, what your dreams are like and whether or not um, you feel a, an elevated sense of anxiety when being there. Because that's kind of um, indicative of a high EMF. So yeah. just a few things. Uh Brandon Fugel, who's the owner of Skinwalker Ranch, really takes that into account. And, you know, people are like, why doesn't he open up the ranch to the public? Why doesn't he have tours? And I see it all the time in, in the comments on Facebook. And you have to understand that there's a something taking place that has caused people injury. And 
they're keeping people from going on there for their own safety. Yeah. And there's a lot that goes into being able to enter the ranch in the background. And I can't talk about it, but, uh, you know, there's just a ton of safety protocol uh, in regards to any type of uh, research or investigation that takes place. And uh, again, people think it's for the, you know, the wrong reasons, but uh, I, I think it's all for good. And you got to remember too that if you have people running around all over the place, you're ruining the data collection. It's being contaminated. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. and then in re- in regards to uh, the the ranches, you know, Skinwalker Ranch has a lot of times you have this negative feel to it where when you're at blind frog ranch it's the total opposite you just feel great Mm. um (laughs) and i don't know how to explain it It, it's just you just feel the difference two opposite fields of a magnet it's very well could be or maybe it's been beat into people's heads so much about the negativity in Skinwalker that you already have that in your mind when you go there. That too. And it could be part of the psyche. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, But but in regards to, you know, seeing that these effects on certain individuals, um, there's obviously a physical aspect to it. Um, And and then in regards to your question, it's interesting because I'm going to be uh, giving a new presentation at Phenomicon. It's the first ever uh, Phenomicon. They're having it in Vernal, Utah in September. And a large part of my presentation is on what you just talked about and what you asked me. Wow. Oh, nice. Now, this uh, Vernal, where this is going to take place, that is the same location where these UFOs were seen just a few days after Roswell? Yes. Oh. Yeah, Ver- Vernal is the closest large city to both of the ranches. It's there on the Uintah Basin in Uintah County. And uh, it, it's going to be a combination of the History Channel and Discovery Channel, uh, Skinwalker Ranch and Blind Frog Ranch. Uh, there in September with uh, just some amazing uh, speakers. And then uh, they're going to be taking people to the front of the ranch or you're going to get to be able to go on to Blind Frog Ranch, which would be really neat for a lot a lot of folks that are participating. Our time is quickly running on out, you might say. We got, uh, what, about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, of the places, I guess, that... Uh, you've investigated uh, have you come across a place that has the most you might say paranormal activity uh, yes it's uh, in Shiwakan which is on the west coast of Mexico uh, um, it's right outside of uh, La Soledad de Maciel would be the closest town or the largest town would be Zihuantanejo and Iztapa on top of the pyramid, uh, which is uh, completely covered in clay, there is a square on the dead center. Uh, It's about two feet high. It's about eight by eight. And the outer uh, structure are, it's block and, uh, not block, but rock and mortar. The energy levels coming up out of this square are what I've never seen before. And the locals, when they show you the, their cell phones of the amount of UAP above it is incredible. And on several of these cellular phones, uh, we were, my, when I say we, my wife and I were shown, there seems to be this purple energy that is so vibrant. It looks like purple velvet uh, drapes coming up out of the two sides of this square. And when this is happening, there are not just one, but two UAP. Uh, one looks to be saucer shaped and the other one cigar shaped. Hmm. And 
four other ruins that are about 40 uh, kilometers away on either hillsides or on mountaintops are directly aligned with this square on top of this pyramid. And this pyramid is yet to be opened up. Uh, the archaeologist doesn't want to do that because of uh, looting that would occur right away. But uh, what must be inside of it is just intense. And I'm just so excited. I can't wait to be able to, you know, get in there or at least uh, get more of my uh, ground penetrating radar and 3D imaging and see what we can see in at the top. So have you ever uh, captured any audio like on a recorder no no audio okay it's out there (laughs) just depends on where you go (laughs) Uh, so uh, well these pyramids it's fascinating do we do you know how much of it's still left underground So it's been, uh, the outside has been uncovered, and uh, they say it's over 3,000 years old, but it's a lot older than that, and it's completely covered in a clay that is perfect. Nothing's touched it except for when the archaeologist decided to use explosives to remove the dirt and debris. (laughs) He damaged parts of it, but so far only two steps have been uncovered leading into it. Um, wow. So I, I couldn't even tell you how many steps it would take. There's probably another 60 to 80 until you're inside based upon, you know, the outside perimeter of the, the pyramid. And uh, it, unfortunately, it's just out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, there's very little money to to excavate, yet alone have security. And, and then it's Mexico. So security would probably be the one doing the most looting. So... It's just a it's a hairy situation in order to be able to, you know, move on the project. Wow. Well, is there any place that you would uh, like to go to do some of your investigating that you haven't been? Yeah, there's uh gosh, I, I pull out a laundry list for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've I've done a lot of uh, work lately in Scotland, so uh, Scotland and Ireland. So I'd like to continue with the Carns further north that I haven't been to yet to document uh, all the glyphs and artifacts and. Uh, do more uh, GPR around them to show, uh, you know, the, the academia there if they've missed anything. Because a lot of these were excavated, you know, 100, 200 years ago. And, yeah. you know, you didn't have that technology available then. So, you know, just like what's happening in Turkey with all this being found underground, I'm sure it's still there. Yeah just a matter of getting out there with a permit and a shovel and a whole lot of sunscreen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. Our time is uh, quickly running out. We got like uh, two minutes before we start wrapping everything up. So if you guys got any other questions, you need to jump them in there now. Well, well, I guess my question page, is oops. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. I was just going to say on the report page, I've uh, got the link to uh, Phenomicon for your uh, Skinwalker Ranch panel Thursday at 4 o'clock, uh, September 9th. So cool. Oh, great. Thank you. All right, Barbara. Um, I guess is um, do you have any uh, reservations about going back to Skinwalker Ranch or to Blind Fog Ranch at any time? Uh, as much opportunity as I can get to be out there and uh, use the equipment, I'll take it. Okay. So you're not afraid of it as well, because you don't have any no. reservation about going out there. Okay. No, I, you know, I, I always see uh, the unexplainable, or if you call it paranormal, mm-hmm. as just uh, something to um, figure out until it becomes science. Or, or the normal. 
Yeah. Personally, I even though it's it's a fascinating topic to the Skinwalker Ranch. Personally, I don't want to go out there. Uh, <laughs> like I said, I I have a problem with high EMF. I also have a very very big and very respect for Native American beliefs and their customs and so forth. And I will not mess with anything like that, you know, skinwalkers uh, of any nature. I, I just don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, and also, I'm not real crazy about heat, bugs, snakes, and ticks. <laughs> no, not happening. <laughs> so I won't be going out there. I'll watch it on TV, oh, and I'll right. hear it from you next time you're a guest. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh I guess uh, we got like uh, three minutes, and uh, I guess we can kind of like start uh, getting ready to close. Um, I want you to give out uh, all your information where people can follow you and find you, and then I want you to hold on till after we're off, and then we'll talk to you a little bit and thank you. Sure. So uh, you can find a little bit about me and my author page and the books at amazon.com forward slash author forward slash James Keenan. I'm also on Facebook as James Keenan or dark shadows and catastrophe, which is the name of my first book. I will be appearing at Phenomicon in Vernal, Utah, September the 9th through the 11th and <clears throat> giving a presentation uh, that's really going to go into a lot of the data uh, that was asked earlier about, uh, you know, what's occurring in regards to the energy. Is it uh, being directed or individuals being, you know, targeted? And then I will also be in L.A. at uh, the LAX Hilton for the Conscious Life Expo, September the 17th through the 19th. And I'm going to be with uh, Caroline Corey doing ancient secrets and earth mysteries all right nice. you got a full plate yeah. wow uh, pretty okay. excited to get the info out yeah. <laughs> all right. i'm glad it finally is starting to get out there i mean that's one thing i love about the show is before it was so secretive and there's a lot more openness with brandon fugel and uh his operation it seems uh -huh. yeah you, you know Brandon, he gets kudos from me. I mean, just the level of professionalism that he went out and got the best people. Eric Bard, people f fail to realize he's a physicist as well. You know, he's not just uh, a guy he picked off the street to run the research. The man's amazing. And, uh, you, you know, just the, the caliber of people. Uh, Brandon trusts them and they're they're all good and you know you can depend on them and what they say uh, they're not making it up for the you know the the camera it, it's uh, legitimately what they believe is happening uh, awesome. all right uh, Tammy who we got for next week well next week our guest will be Rick McCallum author movie producer stunt coordinator and the author of Ghosts believe in me. So oh, listen in as he tells us how he came to have the passion for paranormal investigation. All right. With that, it's time for us to run. I appreciate everybody listening tonight. And I want to thank everyone. So this is Henry Foister. Jeffrey Gould. Barbara Duncan. Cat Gash. And we will see you next week at the same time, hopefully. Good night, everybody. <laughs> You've been listening to The Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. Join us again next week at the same time for more of The Paranormal View.